Good morning. Today many of you are concerned and anxious about what's going on in our country and the direction that it is going. Now, meanwhile, others are relishing the changes that are going to be coming in January. It is reasonable to assume that our country is going to be changing in many different fronts. Domestic and foreign policy, taxes and economics, agendas and priorities, and freedoms and restrictions. All of these we can imagine changing in coming days. Anytime there is a change from a preferred state, I mean a situation where we like it, we always get apprehensive. Doesn't matter what the case is, what the situation is. This morning I'm going to be looking at a passage which speaks of God's plan for the nations. It doesn't start there, but the Apostle Paul speaks of God's overarching plan for the course of this world and for man's walk in it. I'd like you to turn with me, if you would please, this morning to Acts chapter 17. As we look at this text, we find Paul in Athens and provoked in spirit by a very pagan city with wicked worship of idols at every turn. You can see this described in those early verses in Acts chapter 17 after Paul gets to Athens. Knowing the truth and seeing the error on every side, Paul then engages those who are near him in the common places where he could talk with the people. People that, it's very interesting, the phrase is there, just happened to be present. I never noticed that phrase before, but it's here in Acts chapter 6, just Acts 17. Reading verses 16 and 17, Acts chapter 17, we find, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him, as he was observing the whole city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who, here's the phrase, happened to be present. That's amazing when you think about it. We just think of random contacts that we have with people, and God was sovereignly ordaining that some of the people just happened to be there on the day Paul showed up and started talking to them. Paul could have been over in the synagogue at that time, or he might have been at home, or he might have been whatever else he was, but he happened to be there, and those people happened to be there. And it's amazing because of the fact that you've got people that cross your paths who just, quote unquote, happen to be there, just randomly. You're on the street, you're working the side of your yard, you know, your car breaks down, you end up someplace waiting in a doctor's office, and there are people that just happen to be present wherever you happen to be at the time. So that's kind of interesting just to look at the context and even how the scriptures, I mean that phrase could have been left out and the whole story could have gone ahead and it would have been fine. We could have just said, well, Paul preached in the synagogues and talked to the Jews, and then he talked in the marketplace. And you get the idea. But it's that phrase that God chose to include with those who happened to be present. It caught my attention as I was reading, looking at the text. Now, some of uh, those who hear Paul, when they hear him, they want to hear more. And so they say, come talk with us in the Areopagus. That was an open place in uh, Athens. It was on one outside of the city. It was an area where councils would meet, where courts and where decisions were made. And they said to Paul, you come and talk with us there. So we find in verses uh, going on later on in Acts 17, Paul then speaks to them. And I'd like to break apart Paul's message into three different parts for our purposes this morning. The first is in verses 24 and 25. In verses 24 and 25, Paul corrects wrong thinking about God. Then in verses 26 and 27, Paul explains God's plan for the nations. That's what ties in with my introduction this morning. God's plan for the nations, verses 26 and 27. Then in verses 28 through 31, Paul calls people to repent because of coming judgment. And here is Paul's challenge to them after he has corrected their wrong thinking, talked about God's plan for the world, and said, this is now what you need to do. From an apologetic standpoint, and when I say that, apologetic means from a perspective of giving a defense and an explanation, Paul begins with God before creation. This is an appropriate place to start today as well. So in Acts chapter 17, verse 22, we find Paul beginning his discourse. Verse 22, I'm going to read down through verse 24. 
So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Paul speaks of origins and God's sovereign authority over all since he made everything. Paul is establishing a point at this early point in his discourse saying, God made you, God made everything, and he certainly doesn't need your altars, and he doesn't need your temples. He's not part of the material world in any way, shape, or form. Paul's going to come back to this point a little bit later on. In Athens, the worldview of the people at that time was based on a polytheistic, in other words, a multi-god belief, and there are many altars and temples for worshiping all these different gods that happen to be there. We can even see just by Paul's reference to this, this altar to the unknown god that they really want to make sure they had all the bases covered. Uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about the cultural setting, talking about the altars and all of that, but that's not going to be, that's not really necessary for what we're talking about looking at today. As Paul was writing and talking to these, you know, as Paul was talking to these people, their worldview was very different from the worldview of the people that you might happen to meet. It's not very likely that you're living in America. It's not very likely that you're going to be walking into any city in our country and find multiple altars and temples to different gods with people bowing down and bringing sacrifices. That's not probable right now. It's statistically improbable you're gonna find that no matter where you go in our country, at the present time. However, if you were to consider what you are likely to find in almost any city in our country, it is probable that you'll find people that have embraced naturalism, a worldview that leaves God out and assumes naturalistic causes and processes. In other words, they have no need for God since they don't believe that he was part of any of what exists right now. They believe in whatever uh, Whatever their philosophy might be for origins, all the way up through how all the different species and everything created, the amount of time, and how all you've heard, you know what the science stories, and what, not stories, but you know the science that's taught, and that's typical what you're going to find. You won't find what Paul saw, but you will find people that are guided by a worldview that embraces a naturalism, which has no need for God. But I would say that for this reason, it can be helpful to ask people today to postulate a beginning very different from what they might think. They don't already believe in any kind of God or gods that whether it be like Native Americans and their belief in origins or whether it be like some other Eastern religion or whatever it might be and their belief in the origins and how the world and everything got here. From Paul's perspective, he is teaching the truth about God and we should follow his example and recognize people need a correct view of God. The problem is that that's hard to get inside your brain. When you've been looking at something a certain way all your life, as for any of you, you've always looked at it a certain way. For you then to make a dramatic shift from how you've always interpreted your reality to a new way of looking at things, that's very difficult. Jim was sharing earlier about how God delivered him from one whole system and way of looking at things, just delivered him completely to a different one. That is significant. He spoke about how significant it was for God to do that. Imagine someone, if you would, if you were to go to some remote little village in some other remote corner of the world, and all their lives they've been taught that there are spirits that are in all the trees and all the rocks and all the streams and everything, and that in all these different spirits, you've got to appease all these different spirits and keep all the spirits happy in order for you to be able to live quiet and peaceable lives in that particular village. And here a missionary comes in and says, oh, that's, that's all bunk. There's no such thing as that. And meanwhile, the witch doctor and everybody else is getting kind of upset because this is a total change. And for them to embrace and understand the fact that there is a God that created all 
It's a whole different mindset shift for them in that African, South American, Asian village where this is all brand new for them in that setting. Now, if you would, think about a person who is steeped in the, in the thinking philosophy and way of interpreting life around us today in our country, and there's a naturalism there. There's a whole different perspective from one that establishes a God of creation at the very beginning. And so that is an appropriate starting point. So as we would look at this, we might have to say to the person today, imagine if you would, a beginning, a beginning of the world and everything that exists, all material reality, that's all embraceable, all encompassing, includes all time, includes all the material world. Imagine a beginning with a real, a good, a supernatural being. Imagine this being being outside and apart from, separate, distinct from the space-time continuum. In other words, a God that is not part of anything that exists or anything you can see or anything you can experience. That's a key word. A God that's apart from all of that, outside of, separate from. And he is the one who doesn't exist in space or time at all or the material universe. One who is almost, to use a poor parallel, but to use something that might be helpful, almost in a different dimension. And a being with incredible power to speak worlds and universes into existence. It might be necessary today with the person that you might quote unquote happen to meet, to challenge them into thinking very differently from how they process everything through the grid and through the channels that they've been fed for all the years of their lives. It won't necessarily be harder, it won't necessarily be any easier for them to understand your position of a God of creation than it is for the person who's been living in a jungle hut all his life and trying to give fetish uh, different types of worship to these animistic spirits that indwell everything. It's a whole different perspective. However, the person has to entertain and begin to understand this is where our holy God the God of creation dwells. He is separate. He is apart from. When it says that he is holy, 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 he is separate, other, apart from, distinct from everything in creation. He is not part of the physical material world. He is other than outside of. He is holy. And the word holy has the idea, the concept that God is other than all of creation. Certainly we understand it means he's righteous and just as well. But God is holy. He doesn't dwell, and this is what Paul's point is here, this God that is above holy doesn't dwell in temples made by mere human hands. He doesn't need those buildings, whether they're made out of marble or brick or granite or whatever they're made out of. He doesn't need those. He's outside. If he spoke the worlds into existence, why does he need this little shanty, no matter how fancy it is, made with masonry or gold or precious stones? And he doesn't need their sacrifices either. And Paul's point here, their gods are so far below. The ones that they worship are totally different from the God who exists. He is other, he is holy, he is separate, he's supreme, he's omnipotent. And Paul says of him that this is the God. He doesn't need all this stuff that they go about doing. In these two verses, Paul has begun to correct their understanding about God, his nature, his power, and his authority. Next, Paul speaks about God's overarching purpose for nations, and that ties in with where I began this morning. This God who is over all and supreme controls both the starting points and ending points of nations and people groups and what their land boundaries will be. This is what Paul is going to mention, and he's in the next couple of verses, God's in control of your beginning times and ending times, and how much jurisdiction and land area you're going to have and you're going to control. God has a purpose in the starting and ending times, and this is important, God has a purpose in the transitions from one group to another occupying the same land. Look at what Paul says, Acts 17, verses 26 and 27. This is the God that Paul's speaking of, he says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to dwell on all the face of the earth. That, that, that's really broad. 
from one man all the people to cover the whole face of the earth from the North Pole to the South Pole and as however far you want to spin the world one way or the other east to west top to bottom God made from one man all people on the whole face of the earth God's over all and he determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation this is interesting that God has foreknown, foreordained, been in control of how different nations would rise and fall. How before it got to the size of nations, when there were like tribes, how the tribes would vie for territory and they'd want someone else's territory because the grass is always greener on the other side. They always want whatever their fishing rights are of, their, of where they happen to be. Or if it wasn't that, it might be the resources, natural resources. And so they've gone for them. But you know what? The, something that's interesting is that the starting and ending points of one people group occupying a land does not go smoothly. And think about the logistics of this. Paul has said that God's in control of the starting point and ending point and the ge geographical jurisdiction. Think about the transition from one people group to another down through the course of history. You took some history in school. Whether you want to, you pick the continent, I don't care. Pick the continent, pick the people group, but you don't find that these transitions go smoothly. Whether it happened to be Asians, whether it happened to be Native Americans, there wasn't all just one great big happy, wonderful world over here in North America before Columbus happened to come mess it all up. They were fighting with and vying with each other for territory. They were killing one another. They were taking each other's land. And it was the same thing. It wasn't any better on the other side of the Atlantic. The Europeans were doing the same thing. The same thing was happening on the continent of Africa. The tribes in Australia were doing it, and it was happening with the countries in Asia. People are killing and trying to take control of. It's been that way all over the whole world since the very beginning. In other words, the starting point and stopping point is not necessarily a smooth transition. I've tried to make a little bit of a metaphor, a parallel, a simile, whatever you want to call it, of cars going onto an, inter, onto an interstate. You can imagine how it's supposed to work. Everybody follows the rules. You know, you've got your driver's license, you learn how to drive. You know that when you're going to get on Interstate 81, that you come up on the entrance ramp and you kind of, you wait your turn until there's an opening and the traffic, and then you just pull out so easily and you accelerate going up the hill and eventually you get to Syracuse or wherever it is you happen to be going. And everything goes smoothly, and the other cars, they sort of don't hit you, and you don't hit them. At least it's supposed to work that way. And everyone gets along just fine. Now, if only it would work that way so smoothly with nations. All of a sudden, God wants a new nation to come on the land. And so, okay, all of you just move aside. All of you that are living there now, you just got to move away. <laughs> because I want another people to come here now. Well, it doesn't work that way. Um, instead, sometimes the other nation, the newcomers, come to the highway aggressively. They're smashing and pushing out of the way whoever is there before them. Or they come with like earth moving size equipment when everybody else just has motor, normal cars. And these giant tractors and trucks and bulldozers, you know, you've seen the pictures of what they use for mining. These monstrous bulldozers that they, you know, they, they put a normal bulldozer in front of it and it looks like you can hardly see it there in front of the blade. It's so huge. Well, you have these people that come in like to the highway to Interstate 81, they have earth moving size equipment, and they just rush over and run over anybody else that's in the way. Well, when nations take over other nations, it sometimes works that way. We've seen that in history. It doesn't matter the culture, it doesn't matter the continent, but we can see that that takes place. And the thing is that God has a purpose for what's taking place through all of this. Paul tells us in the next verse, of what his purpose is and how this is supposed to work. The newcomers sometimes come, though, with great power. They sometimes come very aggressively. Sometimes they just overwhelm with sheer numbers. There are just so many of them. You know, you've seen those movies sometimes where it doesn't matter who it is, but it could be a Western. It can be this, this little covered wagon that's going across the prairie. And all of a sudden, the camera pans up and you see the hillside. And here you see a whole run, a whole bunch of people that are getting ready to come down on their horses and attack the covered wagon. Or the same thing could be over in Spain. And over in Spain, and you can see this poor little village 
And all of a sudden, the camera pans up to the hills, and here are all looking down from every side, it's the enemy. Well, sometimes that happens in terms of when one country is overthrown. There's just sheer, number, sheer numbers. Other times, it's a guerrilla warfare, as we saw in uh, Vietnam. The guerrilla warfare whereby there's an attack and then a retreat, an attack and a retreat, and you never know what side it's going to come from. You always have to be alert. You always have to watch out. You never know what's going to happen, and, and that sometimes happens, and gradually a country or people are overthrown by this type of attack. It never works out easily in my highway metaphor that they just say, okay, it's your turn. We'll wait your turn. You can just nicely pull in and take your place in the course of history. And we'll just sort of retreat back and others can pull ahead and we'll just all move into the flow of history and all works out well. Instead, nation has overthrown nation through wars of conquest, alliances, intrigue, diplomatic outmaneuvering, and overpowering since the dawn of time. Now, all of what I just said, as I've given you my metaphor, as I've given you the illustration, is what's happened is one nation has taken over another nation. But Paul's point at this point is that God is in control of all of this, and he uses it for his purpose. We can look in the Bible and see descriptions of people groups that were overthrown by others. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but even the book of Genesis, you can see the kings who took advantage and overthrew the cities of the plain where Lot and his family were dwelling at that time. You can look in the book, uh, you can look and see in the description of the people as they were about to enter the promised land, that when it describes the people that were there, it says they overthrew the people that were there before them, and they dispossessed their land, and they took over. And then the Israelites come along, coming up out of Egypt. But God is in control. There used to be people living there. They're gone. We can see this. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, we have an interesting setting. We have Nebuchadnezzar, who's had a bad dream. He's had a concerning dream. He doesn't know how to interpret it, what it means. It was something that he saw, and he woke up, and he knew it was really, really significant. But he can't remember all the details. You ever had a dream like that? You just had a really interesting or cool dream, or you wish you knew how it ended, and you wake up and you, oh, man, I wish I knew how that worked out. Or have you ever woken up in the middle of the night, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, and you wake up and you knew that you just had this dream, and you don't know how it ended. And you wish you could go back to sleep and finish the dream so you knew how it would work out. At least that's happened to me. I don't know if anybody else. And the problem is that it never works that way. You go back to sleep and you dream a different dream that's totally different, or you, you don't at all go back there again. Nebuchadnezzar had this particular dream, and nobody could figure out what it was that he had. Daniel's the one that he finally makes it to the king's house, and Daniel uh, begins by saying, King, God is the one that has the answer. Well, I'll tell you what God said. God gave Daniel an understanding of the dream, and Daniel explained that the dream spoke of coming world empires and kingdoms. This is what ties into our text in Acts 17. It's talking about God who controls who lives where for how long. Daniel 2, verse 31, Daniel says, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you. Its appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold. Its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Well, I'll stop our reading at that particular verse. God revealed to Daniel that each of the different metals or parts of the image represented different kingdoms. Now, this is very significant because it's more than just God letting Daniel have a peek through the curtain. You think of Wizard of Oz and the peek behind the curtain to see the, the wizard guy that's standing there controlling all the, the machine. 
It's not that God just pulled back the curtain so that Daniel could see what the future held. The point more than that is that God was in control. And God was going to be the one that was going to be behind the transition from the gold to the silver, to the bronze, to the iron, to the clay mixed with iron feet. God was dictating and he's in control. Daniel chapter 2, verse 36. Starting, I'm just going to read a few of these verses. This was the dream. Now we'll tell you the interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. That is so significant because God gave Nebuchadnezzar that position. God's in control. Verse 39. After you, there will arise another king, a kingdom inferior to you. And then a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. In verse 40. And there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, and as much as iron crushes and shatters all things, so like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. I'm going to stop there for that part of the chapter. It's important to note that this was not just a prophecy of what God was showing would happen, but it was more that it showed, it tied, it showed what God was doing and was integrally related to God's sovereignty. Now go back to the verses of introduction, verse 19 and 22. This is where Daniel begins. He says, The mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel said, look at this, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs and removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men, knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things, who knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Those are really powerful words when you look at those. Here is Daniel telling Nebuchadnezzar, the king that is over the empire, saying God is the one that controls, and he really pulls the strings, and he's the one that sets up kings, and he removes kings. Coming back to Acts chapter 17 and Paul's message, God is in control, and he determines and has a purpose for the nations. The next point that Paul makes is that God uses nations and their trials and difficulties to move men and women to seek his face. This is so important. God has a reason for why he does all this. He doesn't just arbitrarily move nations around and knocks one out, puts another one in its place for no reason whatsoever. God is looking at the men and women of the kingdom. God cares about the people because kingdoms are going to rise, kingdoms are going to fall over the course of the history of our nation, of our, of our world, of everything. It's going to end one day. But people will go on because souls are eternal. They last. God has given you a soul that will last. God has given me. God has given to us. We are going, the nations are going to leave, but one day all of us will be someplace. And God uses the, the machinations, the movements, the manipulations, the control, and the ups and downs, vicissitudes of nations and kingdoms and empires for his purpose because God cares about the souls of the people. And this next verse is where uh, Paul goes on and he talks about that. It's important to note in human nature that, I'm sorry, the next point that, that Paul makes is that God uses the nations in trials and difficulties to move men and women to seek his face. The nations are just a tool. The kingdoms are just a tool. The territories are just places where people have to be put on the board of the world. Like you put your peer, you put... You play some of the different board games today. You place your pieces to get ready to play the game. And people are placed in different places, but ultimately it's for the redemption and the reconciliation of their souls. That's what God cares about. It's important, though, to note in human nature that people do not look for something better or for relief when things are going well, when they are happy as a clam, whatever that phrase is supposed to mean, you know what the phrase is. He's as happy as a clam. 
how do you know half clams are even happy? I can't even tell if they're smiling. I mean, sometimes they're open, sometimes they're closed. You open them up and they just like a mass of muscle that's there. I don't even, can't even see a face on the things. I don't know where the expression happy as a clam came from. <laughs> However, you know what I'm talking about. The point is that when we are happy as a clam, we're not very likely to look for change. We have no motivation because we're happy and content in that place. And it's been the same way down through time. It, it, is, it is in difficulty and hardship that people look for relief. Think of the book of Exodus. When things were going well, excuse me. Yeah, think of the book of Exodus, Genesis and Exodus, the books. When things were going well, while Joseph was the ruler next to the Pharaoh, there was no com recorded complaint. But when another king arose who didn't know Joseph, things changed and life got hard. It got very hard. In fact, we find in Exodus chapter 1 that the people finally cry out to God. God hears their complaint, and that's when God sends Moses. But it was only under the difficulty of the different Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph that people cried out to God. Or look for a minute, I'm not going to turn there, but think of the book of Judges. You know the sequence of how things work in Judges. It's up and down and up and down and up and down. In the book of Judges, when things were going well, the people seemed to forget God. And they did what was right in their own eyes. And then God allowed an oppressor to come in. The oppressor came in, and when they were oppressed, then they repented and they turned to God for deliverance. In other words, it was when the difficulty came that people started looking up. When everything was going fine and they were happy as a clam, hey, they don't need God. We'll do things our way. But when difficulty came, things changed and people looked to God. So think about Acts 17. If God is the one that determines the beginning and ending point of people groups and land and territory, it's often at those transition times when oppression comes and the oppressor comes in with his huge bulldozer and bullies his way onto the highway that the cars start scrambling and figuring out, uh oh, what are we going to do now? Things have changed. And people cry out to God. We see it in the book of Judges, repeatedly through the whole book of Judges. We see it in the course of the history of mankind, and we can certainly see it in the Old Testament and other scriptures as well. Paul explains that God's purpose, though, as he controls the geopolitical lineups of nations, is that people groups would be moved to seek him. And that's Paul's point of God's purpose with the nations, is that people be moved to seek him. It's significant to keep in mind for our understanding of history and the times when we are living now. God has a purpose. He has a reason. We may say, I wish it were otherwise. I'll tell you a lot of people in the Old Testament and other lands wish things were otherwise. But God has a reason that's bigger than ours, and he wants people to be drawn to him. God can use the relative peace of the Roman era, Pax Romana, as a means for the relatively, e relatively easy spread of the gospel along the Roman roads under Roman protector, protection for missionaries and the Apostle Paul to spread the gospel over what was then under the whole Roman Empire. The gospel spread under the peace of Rome during the first century. God can later use the prosperity and giving of his people in England or America to fund missionary movements to take the gospel to the farthest reaches of the world. We can see this in terms of England back in the 17th, uh, 18th century, uh, 19th century. We can see it in America in terms of how God has sent missionaries out through the prosperity and giving of his people. It's funded the missionary works and the gospel is gone. God uses that. But also God can use the heat and oppression of wicked atheistic governments in China and North Korea to purify his people. And God can use the heat and the pressure. This is what Peter was talking about in 1 Peter chapter 1. We've gone through 1 Peter. Uh, it's what Peter talks about his people living under hardship and difficulty, of being misunderstood by the people that are around them, of being name-called, marginalized, having difficulty. That's the book of 1 Peter. We, we finished 1 Peter, but that's what it was talking about. And God can use his children living under persecution and oppression today as a, pest, as a testimony to the people who quote unquote just happen to live around them. Even, though they face, even as they face difficulties and hardships and even though the unsaved don't understand them 
as Peter speaks about this throughout his epistle. And God can use us in our situation, however it changes in the coming days, in January, in the next four years, or whatever, for his purposes, to lead people to seek him. Paul writes in the passage I alluded to earlier, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4, I urge that entreaties, prayers, petitions, thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may live quiet or tranquil and peaceful lives in godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. The next verse, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Folks, there it is again. It's showing itself. This is the purpose of God. God controls the destinies of nations and people groups for his purpose that people would seek him. And so now to go further, Paul then says, Going on, Acts 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men, that all people everywhere should repent. Because he fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now Paul again corrects their understanding about God. God is not like anything formed by man's hand. Paul points out in Romans that Man consistently wants to make a God that is like himself, a God like something he can see materially, a God that's an image of something that's created, a God that is no better than something that they can kill or, or that they can take control of or they can make another image of it, whatever it is, a calf or a sheep or goat or whatever it might happen to be. In Romans chapter 1, Paul said, verse 19, that which might be known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. That's a, a tremendously significant verse to me in my life. I, I won't elaborate on it now, but that verse is tremendously important. God reveals himself through his created world. Going on. Because of this, people understood um, they were without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they were futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. So professing themselves to be wise, we don't see any of that today, do we? Yeah. People that say, oh, we're so smart. We have you, oh, believers and Christians are so naive, old and stupid to believe the words of the Bible. We've progressed way beyond that now. We've left it behind. Paul says, professing to be wise, they became fools. Just as the people exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man or birds or four-footed animals and crawling things. The same would be true that neither is God the product of our imagination. Man needs to understand that God is God. As you have opportunity, you need to point this out to people. God is God. He doesn't fit their preconceived idea of who he was. He didn't for those that were made an image and they bowed down and worshiped, nor does he for the people today that imagine that God must be whatever they might imagine. He is above. He is different from our imagination. He is holy. He's apart from the material world. It is important for man to understand that one day he will stand before God to answer. Therefore, Paul tells them the right response before this God is repentance. This is where you need to come. You need to repent. In Romans, he talks about the people that knew what was right and did it wrong anyway. In the heart of man, there's a sense of right and wrong, and people need to repent before God for their wrong, for what they, what they have done. Today, as believers in America may not be happy with the outcome of this past week, but that 
they must realize, we all must realize that this is in God's hands too. God has a purpose in nations to bring men and women to turn to him. That's what Paul tells us in this passage. God starts and stops nations, controls their spread on the earth because he wants to move people to seek him. And the funny thing is, is that when we're happy as a clam, we're not very inclined to move at all. But when things get difficult, that's when people start to reevaluate and question. And God cares more about the eternal destiny of a soul than a nation that's just a piece that he uses, putting it up and putting it down, establishing kings, removing kings for his purpose. But he wants the souls of men to be reconciled and redeemed. God has a purpose in nations to bring men and women to himself. Sometimes that comes through hardship and difficulty, but it's always our responsibility to live before him in a way that speaks well of him and his holiness. My challenge for you today is to call men and women to repentance. This is where Paul finishes his message. He's, he, he presents that this is people are going to stand before God and raise him for the dead, and that got them all upset. And the conversation sort of ended at that particular point. Some believed and some didn't, but Paul's call was to repentance. This is God's will and purpose of rising, raising, and bringing down nations, and is the appropriate response, response of men and women before him today, to bow down before him in repentance. Paul began by correcting their view of God. Paul explained what God's purposes were, what he does with nations and people. A lot of side trails we could take right here, but we're just going to, I'm going to keep it brief. <laughs> and Paul then at the end says, I call them to repent. Let's go ahead and close the word of prayer. Father, I pray that we might have an understanding of your purpose on earth, how you raise up and how you put down nations, that you have a reason. And it's that men would then grope after, seek after you. Your purpose is for people to be reconciled to you. Oh God, I pray you'll give us boldness to live in our world, no matter where it turns and how it changes in coming days, that we might live as salt and light testimonies to an unsaved world around us. And may we boldly call them to repent of their sin before you, a holy God. Lord, give us opportunities, I pray, because, Father, you orchestrate those people who just happen to be present and happen to be around us. And you've got a reason for putting us there. And you have a reason for controlling the destiny of nations because your desire is that people would ultimately all put their faith and trust in you. Lord, use us, I pray, for your glory, no matter what the future might hold. And Lord, we do pray that you'll give us leaders that, will, that we might live as believers quiet and peaceably before them. And we pray, Father, that you would be glorified through the testimony of our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.